Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here. Today I want to talk to you guys a little bit about beltless training because I do occasionally get people who ask me why do I only train without a belt? What's the point of it? Uh, why do I believe in doing it? Now, I want to state up front that I am not saying this is the only way to train. I am not saying that you're wrong or bad or anything else if you train with a belt. This is purely about training towards a specific goal, why I do it, why a lot of uh, top strength athletes in the world and even world champions in powerlifting do a lot of beltless training why a lot of athletic coaches recommend it for certain types of goals and training. There is, it's not necessarily right or wrong, it's only right or wrong towards a specific goal. So if you prefer to train with a belt and it meets your goals, I'm not telling you that you are wrong in any way. So let's just get that clear up front. All right, the primary reason for training without a belt comes down to the whole thing with functional strength, as I often talk about. It has to do with the fact that if you're in most real world environments and you need to perform, you need your core to perform, you need your back to stay upright, you need strength through your abdominals, your obliques, your spinal erectors, any of those support muscles all through your core. If you train exclusively with a belt, you're not going to have a belt on when you need them for some reason in the real world. You have to pick up something heavy. You have to move something. You have to take an impact or a hit. Your core is not going to respond the same as it does when you wear a belt. And so it comes down to specificity of training. Go back and think about the SED principle used in exercise science. SED stands for Specific Adaptation to Imposed demands. Basically, that means however you train your body to react in training is how it is going to react in other situations, that it's going to adapt to that specific training stimulus that you give it. Now, a lot of people will point out that when you train with a belt, there are some EMG data. Remember, EMG data isn't accurate enough to determine always if one specific exercise is better than another or how much. It can only tell you truly if an exercise is good, bad, or ineffective at all for basically recruiting muscles in a muscle group. Two, when you're putting a belt on, it's really hard to get readings or doing surface readings or not putting biopsy needles in there. So you can't take data like that as definitive. But you do see some EMG data showing more recruitment in the abdominals, in the abdominal area when a belt is worn for heavy lifting. And again, the problem with that is that one, it's not necessarily measuring it the same. And yes, it might cause more growth in those muscles because you are stimulating them a little more potentially if the data is accurate with the belt on. And yes, a bigger muscle has the potential to be a stronger muscle, but a muscle also responds to the way that you train it once you put it into an environment and it affects the way it performs. When you put a belt on, your core is able to work because your abs press against the belt. You have a belt that's on really tight and a belt that's on loose is actually completely ineffective. It needs to be pretty tight for it to be effective. What it does is that it raises intra-abdominal pressure because it allows your abs to compress hard against that belt that's cinched down tight uh, around your waistline that presses against them and it raises pressure in your core and that allows all those muscles through there all around your gut and everything to contract harder because they've got a, like, almost like a hydraulic wall to compress against. They've got that intra abdominal pressure to utilize to their advantage and you can stay a little more stable and upright. The problem is that when you go into any environment where you don't have the belt on, what you'll actually find is that your core can't work as effectively because you've created a different type of stimulus that allows it to do that that's suddenly gone. And you'll note that whenever you do beltless squats is a perfect example. If you've done nothing but belted squats as your primary form of training and you'll pull the belt off, a lot of guys lose a hundred or more pounds off of their squat. They feel floppy, they feel wobbly, they're not stable because they've only trained their core to brace itself when it has something to physically press against. And once that's gone, they almost fold over like a big floppy noodle as soon as a heavy weight gets on their back. Guys who can squat 450 pounds sometimes struggle with 350 or 375 to even stay upright because they've used a belt all this time to train them to keep their core and their torso upright using that extra intra-abdominal pressure. And when it's not there, they just struggle to work with the same weights. They can't even hold the same weight upright on their shoulders oftentimes. And so again, you see a couple of the raw world champions, uh, at least in the last decade, both Dan Green 
and Jamie Lewis and Raw Powerlifting advocate spending at least half the year, and in some cases with Jamie Lewis even more, of the year training on everything without a belt, just to make your core stronger and more versatile in a wider uh, number of environments, and then just putting the belt on when you're peaking for some sort of competition where you can wear the belt and benefit from it. You'll see a lot of athletic coaches who do the same thing, who particularly in combat sports or contact sports, they don't want their athletes getting used to having that belt on because they're not going to have the belt when they take that hit in the guts on a football field or a rugby field or MMA match or a boxing ring. They don't have that belt on. And so when they take that hit in the guts, their core isn't braced as tight as it would be had they done lots of training without the belt. Now, the argument could be made that, well, you can lift a little more weight with the belt so all the extremities and everything might get worked a little better, so it's worth it. And in some cases, that might be true. In some cases, doing squatting and deadlifting and things without a belt will let you lift a little more weight, obviously, so your core doesn't have to really work as hard. You can stay upright easier, and so therefore you might develop your legs, your quad, hamstrings, and glutes just slightly more. So there might be some truth to that. But if your goal is to make your core as strong as possible to utilize it in any sort of uh, sport-specific or real-world activity in which you might need your core to function properly, that belt is not helping you as much as you might think it is. And when I say that, I don't want to give the impression that your core is completely useless or worthless if you train with a belt. It's that you just have less carry over to without the belt. Because any sort of training, a muscle gets trained, it is going to get stronger, it's going to get bigger, it's going to get more stable. Your core is obviously still being worked quite a bit when you have the belt on. It's just that you're not training it to work in an environment without the belt, so it's not going to have as much carry over there because otherwise, the example we gave of the guys who struggle a bit with 350 or 375 on a squat, uh, who've only trained with a belt to get to 450, well, the, had, before they started training and squatting, there's no way they could have held 300 or 350 on their shoulders upright. It would have probably just folded them over. So obviously their core has gotten stronger. I don't want to give the impression that it doesn't. It's just that we're talking about maximum carryover. And so what I would recommend to people is that if your goals do not include trying to get maximum hypertrophy out of your legs, for example, using just a squat, because you can always come back behind after squats and add other exercises for extra metabolic fatigue. So I'm talking about people who are wanting to do exclusively the squat for maximum leg hypertrophy. Yeah, they might actually want to wear a belt for that purpose if they're more concerned about their legs and their core. And some of those people might feel like, well, I can just do extra core work to make up for it. And you know what? That's a matter of perspective. That's your prerogative. If, if that works for you and it meets your goals, then hey, more power to it. Go for it. But for people who are, again, trying to develop core strength and core stability for real world activities, as a primary goal, I'm going to recommend to them that uh, they do the exact opposite. They will want to do most, if not all, of their training beltless, and then, hey, they don't have to spend an extra hundred dollars on a really nice belt that's actually good enough to get the job done, and they can do extra core work on top of it. Extra core work is probably never a bad thing for people who really want a powerful core either, in addition to doing all those squat, uh, beltless squats, deadlifts, push presses, things like that. And the thing to remember with all of this is that at the end of the day, the belt is just a tool in your toolbox like anything else. It has its uses, it has its pros, it has its cons, it has its application. And don't be like a lot of these guys you see at the gym who wear a belt for everything. You go over to some gyms and you guys see guys cinching up a belt to do side laterals, to do uh, curls, to do tricep pushdowns, everything. And it's really hilarious when you think about the purpose of a belt. These are people who are wearing it as a fashion accessory to look hardcore. They don't understand the use of the belt because there are legitimate athletes out there who do benefit from using a belt. And that would be specifically power lifters when they're peaking for a competition where they're wearing a belt, strong men who wear belts in a lot of their competitions, and even some bodybuilders who are trying to get maximum leg development off of various squats and things. Those people are probably actually going to benefit from a belt, but anyone who wants to train for any sort of field sport, combat sport, uh, real world applications, the belt is probably not something they should be utilizing if they want their core to be as powerful as possible. So it just comes down to using the right tool for the job and knowing what your goals are, why you're using a piece of equipment, and whether it's best for you personally to not use it at all, if you're going to reach your goals more effectively without it. And I will say, though, those of you who've been training only with a belt, if you take your belt off and you go back and try to do some of your heavy uh, full body lifts that you've been using only with a belt, it's going to be a humbling experience for you to <laughs> go back and to have to realize how much less weight you could actually lift without one. You'll be surprised. Some of you guys should try it. 
just so that you can see the difference. And it might be a very humbling experience for you. It might be a very amusing experience for you. And at the very least, it might show you that you personally should probably be working on your core a little more. If you have a tremendous difference between the two, your core might actually be your weak link. And it's something that you might want to actually consider working on a lot more if that turns out to be the case. If you lose 100 pounds off your squat or 50 pounds off your deadlift and you pull that belt off. So just give it a try. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative and I will talk to you guys next time.